road. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it is me, Michael Moradzadeh, Commodore of the Pacific Cup Yacht Club, with uh, yet another in our online seminars that take place of the in-person Pacific Offshore Academy, sponsored by Alaska Airlines. Uh, with me is John Tausig and Adam, uh, was it Rutenberg? Um, and I muted him, so now I can't tell. Let's unmute. Adam, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you, give you me got that? it right. Adam Rutenberg, yes. Cool, cool. So they're both doctors. I am not a doctor, so I am mostly going to be shutting up, which is, as you know, uh, difficult for me. Um, the topic is a number of issues relating to medical issues on the boat, ranging from uh, preparing to deal with first aid issues to rather serious items that, that will likely be beyond your immediate ability to handle, but for which for the last several races we've engaged with George Washington University. Um, and they've got uh, consultants, uh, physicians who are available to advise and if necessary, coordinate an emergency response. So um, without further ado, uh, why don't we start with uh, John Tausig and, and John, you'll also describe briefly the, the service that you're associated with. Yeah, yeah, I can do that um, here in a minute. Uh, thanks for having me, Michael. It's for the people that are, are watching, I've, I've been at the Pack Up Seminar, I think this would be my sixth year. Um, and so it would be nice to see probably some of you again. But <laughs> I just see Michael and Adam. Uh, I've got a, uh, a presentation basically about preparedness, um, about how to choose a, a marine first aid kit. Uh, we're going to do a primer on telemedicine. And there's definitely limits to this presentation as to what we can do today. But there's also lots of useful information. And uh, some of the things that you'll want to know, um, I hope, is how to fix things like broken bones and what to do with head injuries and how to deal with COVID and a whole laundry <laughs> list of different topics that we can't cover today. Um, that being said, uh, the goal for um, from my stance is to get everyone thinking about what kind of equipment they want on board and how to sort of judge what the best type of kit is. That is the absolute most popular question we get at Backcountry Medical is what do we put in the kit and um, you know which kit do you recommend? Which kit is better than the other one? Which book is better than the other one? Who should we talk to for telemedicine? And so I'm going to let Adam take that um, front to start and um, I have a slide deck. Um, however, Adam, I think, uh, you know, with just one slide on telemedicine, maybe if you want to just kind of introduce yourself and in, in the program a little bit. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Adam Rutenberg. I'm an emergency medicine physician at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, uh, just so you know, I was following Sunfish when I was, you know, five years old. Uh, before I was a doctor, I spent time uh, crewing on call ships. Um, and uh, I work in addition to being in the emergency department uh, for our maritime telemedicine service here, which has supported your event for a number of years. Um, just so you know a little bit about us, uh, we're a small group of emergency medicine physicians within our department. Uh, and we uh, run this maritime medical access. Uh, we contract with um, a variety of large shipping companies, uh, as well as events such as yours, um, private jets, uh, other sort of remote um, research teams, government contracts, things like that, to provide telemedicine support um, on an emergency basis when needed. Um, so um, the way our service works is you'll be provided essentially with our contact information. We're somewhat uh, platform agnostic, so a lot of what we do is um, over email or satellite phone, uh, and we take consults for emergent medical conditions. So if somebody becomes sick or becomes injured on the ship uh, or on the boat, uh, we're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, 
we sort of have a philosophy of call early, call often. So in other words, it's far better to get ahead of a small issue if you have a little belly pain and you think, oh, that, that feels weird, but I'm just gonna ride it out. It's better to call, have a consultation, and you know, we can discuss um, anticipated course. Um, because as with any other you know, issue at sea, it's better to sort of drill and prepare um, and get information early so that you can head off a large problem while it's still a small problem. A um, couple things that we think are important. So I, I do want to make the disclaimer that, you know, I'm not here to sort of talk about any specific antibiotic or piece of equipment that you should have or, you know, company from which you should buy a kit. You know, I think John's going to talk a little bit more about that. But what is important is that you know um, about who is on your vessel and what their medical conditions are and then what equipment you have on your vessel. Um, so it's very helpful before you go to sea to make sure that you know basically names, dates of birth, and medical histories of people who are on your vessel. Uh, what medical problems do they have? What medications do they take? What surgeries have they had in the past? Um, what allergies they have, especially to medications? You know, and I think John's going to talk a little bit more about this because when you call, these are questions that we would ask. And then it's also helpful for us uh, if you have an available list of what's in your med kit. We don't necessarily need that from everyone in advance before the event starts. But you know, if an, if an issue comes up, we would you know, want that to be emailed to us. Um, and then essentially we'll take a history, um, do a sort of physical exam actually over the phone. The same, you know, you, we can get quite a bit of information um, uh, over the phone and then we'll make recommendations for um, you know, treatment in place. Uh, we have a policy that we don't ever divert, uh, speed up, or evacuate anyone from a vessel without bringing a second physician onto the case um, so that we can ensure that we're not, um, you know, disrupting, uh, uh, you know, your event uh, or, you know, in the case of, you know, oftentimes we're talking with large cargo vessels that cost tens of thousands of dollars a day to divert. Um, so that's our mentality. Um, you know, we want to treat in place if we can, but we also want to make sure that we uh, treat appropriately and evacuate as necessary. Um, we have dealt with pretty much any kind of medical emergency you can imagine um, in any kind of remote location that you can imagine. Um, so, you know, let me stop there and just ask John if there are any specific questions you have for me or things that you'd like, you know, your participants to know about our service. Um, one question I had was about sort of the future trajectory of it and how much you think video will play into telemedicine and kind of what the timeline is for that. Yeah, it's a very good question. So, you know, we do, we're platform agnostic. Um, so we can work with video platforms basically from any provider. Um, we contract with a company called Digigon. You know, a couple general comments about that. You know, we can get a lot of information just actually over the phone and we can have people, uh, you know, on a vessel provide a lot of information about uh, self-physical exam. And we can also receive uh, pictures, photographs, which in many cases, so eyes, rashes, injuries, um, can uh, be very helpful. One of the issues that we run into with, um, you know, video consultation at sea is that bandwidth is often an issue. So there are, you know, obviously satellite time is expensive. Um, you know, we use Digigon as a company because it is um, designed for the maritime environment and it's a low bandwidth uh, product. But again, I, I'm not here to push any specific product. So any vessel that has the capability to do something like Zoom or FaceTime, um, we can connect to. Um, essentially any video service we can connect to. Um, and although we don't always find it necessary, if it's a capability that you have, it's something that we would use in certain situations. Okay. Um, my, my internet was kind of cutting out there. I hope that it was nice and clear and easy for you. You actually illustrated my point perfectly, uh, which, which was that bandwidth is often a problem at sea. And so you have connectivity issues. <laughs> that was not um, let me let me interject one one point here. Uh, a couple of points uh, to, to yours. Um, for Pacific Cup, we do collect uh, on a voluntary basis people's 
relevant med medical details if they're willing to supply them, as well as get a HIPAA release. Uh, we also invite people to post confidentially the contents of their medical kits. So uh, that information in the event something comes up is available to you. And I think, I think I've given you that login uh, previously. We'll do that again, uh, assuming we go forward. The second is um, for people that are out there in, in attendee land, as I said before we started, if you have uh, questions for our speakers, you can post them to the chat or to the Q&A as I see one person has done uh, and I'll relay them. And the question is, experience with crew not fessing up about a medical problem, afraid it would disqualify? Yeah, that's, that's right. So uh, let's see if there's a question in there. I think it's just an agreement from Jim Quancy. Yeah. Uh, oh, he points out, you guys bailed me out in 2018 with a crew member with 104 degree fever who had a pulmonary problem. You guys are good versus land-based doctor was pretty clueless about what to do when there was in a pharmacy down the street and the sat phone a bit garbled at times. Yeah, Jim, Jim uh, and I were talking the other day and he is a huge fan of you. Um, for those that uh, don't know Jim Quancy from the Green Buffalo Project along with Mary online, who is a highly experienced nurse, um, has done the crossing about 8 million times and, and you know, his, his praise is worth a lot. Yeah, so, so we, um, you know, we, you know, our medical director was previously in the Coast Guard, and most of the doctors that do this have some kind of sailing experience, um, you know, whether it's personal or professional. So we, we understand the environment um, that you're in. Uh, you know, just to give you an example, I was on call today for a maritime practice. So I spoke with a master of a container vessel in Japan. Uh, I spoke with a uh, crew member with um, just you know, having high blood pressure issues down in the Caribbean. Um, I don't know how many calls I had today, probably eight or nine uh, all over the world. And so this is something that we do every single day and drill on and have policies on. And, um, you know, in addition to that, uh, you know, we're all emergency medicine physicians who, who take call, but we also have our, you know, we're the largest multi-specialty physician practice in DC. So we have about 800 doctors and I think 51 specialties and subspecialties. So if there is a endocrine issue or, you know, some sort of a surgical issue or a cardiology issue and we need further subspecialty consultation, that's something that we can also bring online. Um, um, if anyone has any specific questions uh, for Adam, if you want to post it to the chat, we can ask him. He's going to be here for just the beginning section, I believe. Yeah, I'm on the East Coast, so it's about 10, 15 here. Yeah. You're, 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 you're welcome to stay. And, and I, I didn't really want to have a start with, with, you know, if somebody's head explodes, here's who you call. Sure. I want to start with, you know, what if you get a splinter? But uh, the timing worked out this way. Yeah, it's fine. And I, I think I'm going to stay on for a little bit and just okay. uh, watch part of this. But I, at some point, I'm going to have to get off. So I would encourage people, if they have questions for me, to po you know, post them now, uh, primarily about our service and what we, what we provide. Well, um, I can segue from that. And I, I did post into the chat, um, if my bandwidth slows down, I'm willing to go uh, sit on my... Uh, on our server here at the house, but <laughs> it seemed to be working uh, for every other meeting. So uh, we'll just go with it. But um, we've got a couple things on the agenda. I'm gonna screen share here and we're gonna look at um, a PowerPoint that was prepared for you guys um, back March when we, when we were gonna all see each other. Um, and this is, this is, of course, the Backup 2020 webinar outline. And we just talked a little about telemedicine. It really is quite a game changer in all of our classes, all the wilderness and remote medical courses that we teach. Um, telemedicine is, is really opened up uh, a whole new layer of um, consultation and just just an invaluable reference. Um, so uh, to get kind of into it, I am not a doctor, although Michael, that did have a ring to it. Um, oh, I didn't I realize that. <laughs> oh, I, I gotta go back well, and change Well, you can keep believing it if you want. <laughs> no, I've been a paramedic for 
about 20 years and uh, I was a flight medic there in the Bay Area down on the Big Sur coast in, uh, in, in the central California I-5 corridor out of Modesto and Merced. Uh, worked on a ton of different ambulances um, and I am now the director for Backcountry Medical Guides and specifically our maritime program here. Um, I'm a 50-ton captain and I've done quite a bit of sailing and bopping around the west coast. Uh, I've been, I live up here in Bellingham, Washington and I split time between Santa Cruz and Bellingham. Um, but uh, that's a little bit about my background. There's my contact info. You guys will have access to all these slides and some of the references that I'll bring up during the, the, um, the slide set. But we talked a little bit about the um, telemedicine program so far. And just some of the, some of the before you go type things. Um, this is before you go anywhere, for that matter, before you leave the dock for a day sail. Um, you know, just real basic stuff. Many of you have been practicing and preaching this for many, many years, but knowing the boat, checking the weather forecast, the tides, the sunrise, sunset, um, and then briefing the passengers. And there's something that we do in flight medicine that is um, mandated by the FAA, which is to uh, go through cue cards and have two people read the cards every single time. Um, I'm going to go come back to this slide, but these are just some of the cards that I've made for our boat um, up here. It's an Alawala 38. We have friends, families, children. Um, we do, we, we went up to Alaska this year and picked up people all over the place. And anytime uh, we just keep these cards laminated in the cockpit. I'll send these over to you guys to, to customize, to make your own, but um, things like the safety brief, uh, we do this every single flight, every single time. So if I've had thousands of emergency medicine flights, uh, every time we go through a card and a checklist and approve it from multiple angles, and it really takes the guesswork out of making sure that you're doing the right thing when it's written out for you. And uh, things like person and water, or man overboard. Um, you can see some of the other procedures that I list. Those are all different cards that we have on the boat and we just keep them laminated on a little ring binder so everyone has access to them. Longer trips, you go through each of them. Um, on shorter trips, maybe you just do the safety brief, uh, talk about shutting off the engine and um, fire prevention and where the fire extinguishers are. But uh, definitely before you go is a great place to start and really kind of brief everyone on the safety of the vessel. Uh, what, what I'm sure everyone can attest to is that prevention is uh, worth a pound of cure and now it's prevention, but uh, anytime, whether you're a hundred yards away from the dock or a hundred miles away or a thousand miles away from a dock, uh, when someone gets hurt on board, it's bad. And it takes a long time to rescue that person when you can't drive up to them. Um, to, it can take hours to do really short rescues. And so when there's something serious, um, ideally, well, before anything happens, you wanna try your best to prevent it. So, you know, these basic, real basic things, demonstrate moving around the boat, bringing a first aid kit, testing radio, and securing the electronics is it's kind of a new one on the list now that um, electronics are such an important piece to uh, almost everything we do. Um, securing those electronics and uh, a friend of mine, Randall Reeves, who did the, the figure eight voyage, and he's a big reason uh, listening on to or reading his blog posts. Um, it's a fascinating story about his trip around the Americas and Antarctica. And on his first attempt, he was rolled, um, took green water through his, uh, one of his windows and swamped most of his electronics, aside from what was a redundancy. I believe he had two sat phones. And so if you are depending on your electronics, um, make sure that you have a really good plan for them. This is a spot device that I had on a kayak trip I did from here in Bellingham up to 
Alaska uh, a few years back. And just like every other piece of electronic equipment, it completely failed, um, which was which was too bad because of course it's supposed to be waterproof and, um, and so forth. So uh, Pelican cases, um, you can get um, Tupperwares that have gaskets to them. You can use something as simple. I really like the, uh, I re well, I love peanut butter pretzel balls, whatever those things are called. <laughs> and those containers are perfect for first aid equipment, electronic equipment. Um, a giant thing of cashews from Costco. It doesn't have to be pretty. A Nalgene bottle is also a great uh, case for anything you want to protect. So just having this list and making sure that you're doing this every time. Um, and that, that is also a concept for your first aid kit, making sure that it's waterproof, um, that it's not going to also degrade over time. When we sailed down to Panama a couple years ago, uh, my wife and I noticed that in our, in our cabinets, it was about 120 degrees at all times. And that can really degrade and destroy your equipment. So for you, the, the person as the sailor, of course, you want to be in good health and be prepared, but attend to obvious medical problems. One of the big ones is going to be dental care and uh, make sure all your records are straight. If you're going anywhere tropical, make sure you have the right vaccines and that you um, check in to, to see with your primary who and what you should be um, looking out for uh, in terms of during your travel, use common sense. So it, it is the responsibility of the person um, to, to really disclose this stuff to the captain of the boat. And someone mentioned in the comments that they had found something out in route. I also had that experience. I found out on a delivery back from Cabo to San Francisco that um, our skipper was withholding his uh, substance abuse issues that had been plaguing him probably most of his life and um, a fairly severe psychiatric uh, history. And those both came to rear their heads at, um, not surprisingly, at the exact same time. And um, it was shocking to see what had happened, but we didn't, we didn't know. And um, to be honest, at that time in my life, I, I didn't exactly ask because I was a crew and the captain was this, you know, um, the, the captain of the ship. And now I, Having since had that experience, and which involved the Coast Guard, um, it just is so important that everyone is in good health and that anything that isn't in good health is fully disclosed to the crew and to your doctor and to everybody. Um, just real quick, how are my connection? How's my connection right now? Is it okay? You, you had a little bit of a glitch back there, but I think we were able to fill in the gaps. I, I think we're doing okay. Okay, good. Um, so getting into some of the kits here, uh, the kits being such an important piece, you know, for me, it, as having a lot of experience in remote medicine, wilderness medicine, I love to improvise kits and um, I build my own kits and I've, you know, I've got this bias that has been nerding around first aid equipment for a couple of decades. Um, but there are there's a lot of things to consider before you buy a kit. And I went on West Marine's website yesterday just to see what they had involved. And there was an offshore medical kit that was $9. And <laughs> offshore. And then the coastal for $17.99. And then there was another Marine kit for $200. And then there's something for you know, 700. And it's just impossible to wade through if this is not something that you're looking at every single piece of equipment. And so that's what I did. I started going through each of those kits to find out what the equipment, what was, what was making an offshore kit 10 bucks. Um, and really, it's all just marketing. Uh, you're going to get what you pay for. And um, sometimes you can, you can overpay. 
And uh, we'll get into some of that right now. So some of the common principles to consider really a really important piece is to analyze the group capabilities. Who do you got on board? Uh, what are their experiences? What is the trip gonna be like? And what are the common emergencies? And we'll go through all of those three uh, pieces here in a second. Uh, get John, John, I wanna, I wanna let you know, you did have another little glitch. We're gonna give you one more. All right, I'm going downstairs. I'm all, going right. Down. all right, this is fun. He, he walked me through his house uh, earlier today too. It's a very <laughs> nice house. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, my wife's coming home any minute. Um, it's gonna get dark before it gets light. It's always that way. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, let me know if anything else happens here. We, we, uh, st we staged this to uh, illustrate the point that you need to be flexible and deal with the circumstances you're in and not insist on just keeping things the way you've set them up. Isn't right. that right, John? That's right. Yes. I got a little nautical theme there. I got a sailboat in the corner. Okay, <laughs> we're back. Okay. Um, okay, so getting to know the members of your group is what we just talked about doing uh, a basic medical survey of, of what types of conditions they have, what types of medications they have, recent illnesses, injuries, and all that. Um, and that couldn't be more timely than it is right now. Uh, making sure the trip is appropriate for the group. Um, so knowing the capabilities of your members. Now, most people are gonna come equipped with a CPR and first aid certificate. Six hour program, most of you have taken it and most of you will have probably understood its limitations. It's incredibly limited in not the CPR as much as it is the first aid component. Um, a CPR class, even at an EMT level is three and a half hours. And so if you get the right instructor and you do the right skills, you can learn that skill really well. Um, however, the first aid component at three and a half hours is just, it, it hurts my feelings sometimes when I'm teaching it um, because there's so much more that I want to put into the program. Um, better would be a two-day class, a wilderness or maritime first aid program. It's going to give you more hands-on skills, going to allow you to run a couple of live scenarios. If you've ever heard of a woofer or a wilderness first responder, that's an 80 hour course. They're, they're offered all over the Bay Area. We have that program down in Big Sur. Um, and that is a really good hands-on skills class. If, if I was going on a boat, I would try to find someone with a wilderness first responder at a minimum. Um, in EMT, you can get uh, there in the Bay Area, they're offered in about 10 different locations at community colleges privately. And it's a really worthwhile program as well. Um, paramedic will take you a couple years or at least a year and a half to get through that. And um, then of course a nurse, a PA. And if you're lucky enough, um, you can get a doc on, your, on board the boat. But it is really, you can see in yellow there, know the specialty slash the experience of the provider. Um, that couldn't be more pertinent you can have a doctor of just about anything with very little emergency medical um, information and strategy. And, um, you know, same with a nurse or a PA. Um, for me, you know, having a, a strong pre-hospital medicine career, I really like that role. And um, I think it fits in well with a boat. That being said, once you get to the PA level or the nurse practitioner level, um, MD or DO, they can um, they have the power to prescribe drugs and so forth. Now, here on land, as a paramedic, you you are not technically supposed to be doing that um, because it is a skill that. Uh, that you have to do medical direction. For. So with the really highly advanced providers, um, they have some liberties that other healthcare providers don't have. But well, John, just knowing this, what kind of specialty you have and, yep. Yeah, this ties into a question that Ken Royal posted. He says uh, he's also a California licensed paramedic and is wondering how to properly obtain narcotics for trauma related emergencies for this race. That's a good question. Um, narcotics, are gonna be a more difficult 
thing to procure. Um, likely you'll have maybe some, well, I'll, let me backtrack and say that there are services out there that provide commercial medical kits that have full suites of antibiotics, antiemetics, um, that have some pain medication. And um, they will write a prescription to the captain of the boat. Uh, there's a Bay Area company called Ocean Medics. I actually was at the Pack Cup seminar six years ago and met Denny Emery. And I've li since looked at their products. I have a slide on it um, in a minute. But um, you, you can carry some of these things on board as a paramedic. It's best to have this coupled with, with some sort of resource like telemedicine. It's a perfect marriage um, to have a pre-hospital provider with the right kit, with the right assessment capabilities, bounce all this stuff off of um, a physician to have you know, the authority to, to give it. Um, there is some gray area in international water, what that means for people's scopes of practice, but um, I don't know if I answered that question or not, but. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you credit. Um, <laughs> and I don't want to get too caught up on this. Um, I'll, I'll add my own experience, which is, you know, I've done this now for 20 years. And when I first started up, you know, I'd mentioned to the, to the doctor during my annual exam what I'm doing and give me these prescriptions to, you know, basically host a rave. Uh, in my last uh, visit with my, with my internist, uh, she was um, pretty reluctant to prescribe anything. Uh, fortunately, a lot of that stuff doesn't expire too fast. So it, it, is, it is harder. You want to establish a relationship with your prescribing doc uh, sooner rather than later and let them know that you're not just drug seeking. Jim Quancy um, uh, asks, and he, he, he typed a very long question that I'm going to summary, summarize. Uh, but basically, you know, over the years, and, and his experience is the same as mine, uh, we would be given uh, a, a three year or so uh, broad spectrum antibiotics to deal with anything from a UTI to, well, appendicitis. Um, it seems now that uh, things are, are getting, um, what does he say, less confident my land doctor understands what's being done several days from land or having to consider abandoning the boat to jump on a commercial ship. Do you have thoughts on three good wide spectrum antibiotics to bring? I've seen two boats with staph infections. Infections. One guy almost died. Yeah, um, three good broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, I mean, I, I it, on my boat it was Cip Cipro, Zbax, and one other thing I forget what. Probably Flagyl. Yes. Yeah. So actually, that, that list that you just gave is the first one that came to my mind as well, ciproflagyl and azithromycin. Right. Um, you know, that's not going to cover everything, but those are three that uh, are, are commonly prescribed. Well, we carry chicken soup as well, so I think we're covered. Yeah, and, and I will, and just to sort of jump back to the prior question, you know, uh, a lot of these services um, that John mentioned will, you know, sell you kits that have the most frequently needed medications and can prescribe, um, you know, prescribe antibiotics, uh, excuse me, prescribe narcotics um, as needed. Um, you know, there's another one in New York called Universal uh, Marine Medical. Um, there used to be a pharmacy in Seattle as well that did a lot of that and the name is escaping me right now. But one of the best things to do is that if you have a personal relationship with your own physician um, and have that discussion, you know, your, your own physician can write a prescription for the captain of the ship. Um, and that for a small boat is probably one of your best options. Yeah, and you know, in tying this back to telemedicine, uh, oh. Frozen. The, yeah. George Washington. No. Oh hey. gosh, darn it. Yeah. My Sorry, back. John. Uh, go back to the phrase tying this back to telemedicine. Sorry about that. Um, right. Tying this back to telemedicine. Um, you know, with all of these different drugs that are prescription, you can really do more harm than good. Um, and to bounce these, the, the symptom, the signs and symptoms, and the patient's profile um, off of 
a physician over the phone is going to really provide a, a lot of peace of mind for not only the patient, but the rescuer. It's, it's really, um, it's, it can be really scary to be out of your comfort zone and have the tools and make the wrong decision. Um, so that's where I, I see a, a really good marriage with, um, you don't need the highest level provider in the world, but having the right resources, having the right equipment, um, and then having a, a, a line to a physician. Um, how's my connectivity now? My right now it's good. So Peter Frey, who's actually quite experienced in this, says sometimes jitter on audio can be reduced by having him turn off his video. That's why he isn't competing for the same bandwidth. That's a really good point. Um, I, I, maybe if we if we get the problem again, or if you want to do it proactively, um, when when you're mainly addressing the slides anyway, turn off your video and see how that works. How's that? Oh man, that's awesome! It's so good. You're really good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll make facial that's expressions. <laughs> so you know, back to knowing the capabilities of your members. Uh, there's people all over YouTube that are showing you how to do these skills and. The gal in the middle, she's about to give herself an NG tube, and there's the Foley catheter. And, and, oh, um, yeah, you don't want to be doing that one. <laughs> you don't. You don't want to be doing that. Um, I've never done those as a, a really experienced paramedic. I put in an NG tube. Uh, that procedure on the far left there, the chest tube. Um, I haven't done as a medic. Um, I know a lot of nurses probably have never done that, or most nurses have never done that. It's a life-saving procedure. It's a life-saving skill. Um, so what do you do? Well, you can't, you can't cover everything, but when you do know the capabilities of your members, you can start to plan for what you don't know um, by aligning with the right service. And let's see here. Oh gosh, now I can't. Um, so understanding sort of the common risks can be done um, fairly easy. We'll go through some of them right now. You can see this list here is off of uh, wemjournal.org. It's Wilderness Emergency Medicine Journal.org. And um, just a real basic search criteria. Uh, but I stole these slides from Kent Benedict, um, who originally brought me to the Pack Cup seminars. And this was um, a case study here where they analyze this large group, they're all, it was all one design race around the world. And there was um, hundreds of people that were involved. Um, they spent a ton of time out on the water and this is what they reported. Um, I think it's important, you know, a lot of people think of injury being the number one thing and everyone's worried about head injuries and accidental jibes. Um, but you can see that illnesses over long periods of time are actually more prevalent than um, than it is to get injured. And we'll go through what the sort of dem, uh, demographics and breakdowns of some of these injuries are. Um, so one, uh, one point on demographics that Betty Gray makes, you need to comment on this, is people have had joint replacements, have prescriptions and must take when other surgeries uh, happen, they should have their own from their physician. That, that just ties into your individual um, medical kit comment. Anyway, right. sorry, go ahead. No, it's a good point. Um, so for the injuries, by far the most common is the uh, minor abrasion contusion. This is what I found on, on long trips and uh, while cruising is that um, you've got, you're going through a lot of your consumables, your, um, your, small, your small cuts and um, sort of ir irritations. Is it, it's gonna be something that you're gonna be replacing in your kit fairly often, um, but Burns are also on there. This is uh, this includes sunburn. Uh, there are special bandages for burns, um, hydrocolloidal bandages. There's special burn creams, and we'll look at some of those types of things here in a sec. Uh, fractures made the list as um, coming in number three. Um, lacerations, which would be sort of deeper than the the abrasion, and um, then some tendon, ligament damage, sprain strains, and last was head injuries. Um, so sort of breaking down the, in, the injuries according to anatomical region, 
you can see the spread there. It's kind of all over the place, um, which isn't that surprising when a boat is rolling and moving and pitching and yawing and, um, you know, really anything's possible. But um, in terms of the illnesses, which were slightly more prevalent, um, you can probably imagine, but um, a lot of people are surprised to see how prevalent gastrointestinal uh, emergencies are. And um, Knowles is a company that does wilderness training. They have a great illustration of a hand and it says the clean hand. And this is all something we're all very um, thoughtful of right now, but the clean hand on a boat that's out in the water is going to have everything from saliva to boogers to fecal matter to urine to whatever it is. And that's on the clean hand. They, they have this just disgusting illustration. And most of what they're finding in terms of gastrointestinal emergencies comes down to personal hygiene and not necessarily food or water preparation. So it's just something to think about in avoiding it. Um, illnesses to the skin. Uh, a big one is um, what I've always known as boat butt or um, you can see there gunnel bottom boils. Um, and most people that have sat in a wet um, pair of fowleys or jeans for that matter over a long period of time on something that's moving will have some of that irritation. Um, respiratory comes in at third and finally seasickness, which is likely uh, very much so underreported. So those were the main um, cases in that trip. And it, it kind of goes along with most types of sailing is that um, you're gonna see some, the, the most common tr traumatic emergency is gonna be minor. It's gonna be contusions, soft tissue injuries. Um, in terms of medical, it's gonna be gastrointestinal and then you'll have a variety of other things to deal with too. And with that, um, allowing each person to carry a personal kit, I think is important to give someone the autonomy of what um, is most common, to give them the little bandages, the neosporin to cover each of their wounds with, uh, to give them seasickness medications, pain medications, so that they're not having to go and break the big kit out, dig through it and come back to it. Everyone should have their own personal kit and really understanding what the equipment is that you're carrying and what the contents of the kit. Uh, when you become more versed in first aid, you start to really bring multi-use materials. And in that case, you can start to omit contents because you have made a plan in your mind of how to either improvise or upcycle some piece of equipment you already have on the boat. And a perfect example of that would be to take um, scissors or trauma shears and then cut a shirt up into pieces and make all the roller gauze that you need. Now you wouldn't need to do that on a big ocean going vessel because you have the space, but when you're on a dinghy or on a kayak or on shore and you have very limited equipment with you or none, you should have an idea of how to at least make something rudimentary um, to get you back to the boat. Um, so some of the kit contents. Now I have a spreadsheet. I'm going to um, pull out of this, uh, pull out of this PowerPoint real quick and show you uh, what's on this. I'll, I'll send you guys um, this as well. But uh, this is anecdotal, but it also comes from thinking about first aid kits for a long period of time and. Um, on our boat, we have a day kit, a quick kit for when we're cruising, we're on dinghies and so forth and so on. Um, and this, this can be really small. You can fit all this equipment into a small dry bag. And um, when you're talking more of a cruising kit, now you're adding the day kit with other pieces of equipment. And they all break down to the same. Yep. Yeah. What were you uh, saying there, Michael? Uh, I think um, uh, uh, there's an alternate view from your fellow panelists. Do you want to share that? Sh sure. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to jump in and contradict, but just with regard to personal kits, um, it's certainly a different philosophy, but I, I'm actually of the opinion that, um, you know, you can have a secondary small kit, but if you, if you have small kits, it might encourage your crew to hide small injuries or illnesses. 
Um, so, you know, a small cut can still become infected. A, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, a, a, you know, a wet bottom that is becoming irritated can ultimately become infected or perforated. And, you know, I, I, it's actually my opinion that really any kind of injury, no matter how small, if it requires any kind of treatment, including a Band-Aid, um, the master should probably know about it um, just so that it can be monitored. But again, you know, di differing philosophies. Yeah. So it's sort of up to each individual to make that decision. Yeah, well, it's up to each each master. Each skill Sorry, each master. Yeah, yeah each. Yeah. Um, and, a, and a question came in, uh, a gener general question, are these materials going to be available? Uh, yes, I believe John has said he's going to provide them to me and I'll put them up on our website as I've been doing with the other seminars. Yeah, so I'll send you guys this, um, this Excel sheet and a couple other ones and we'll go through what some of those are going to be at the end. Um, so this just has uh, sort of the breakdown of wound management, musculoskeletal. And you can see this okay on your end there, Michael and Adam? Yeah, it looks good. Um, medications, this is not a comprehensive list. This is just anecdotal of what's in my first aid kit on my cruising boat. Um, survival environmental equipment. Um, and so those are the basic functions you can see. Um, there's a web link to where to buy some of this oh. stuff. Um, there's some advanced procedures out there that um, they do sell kits for this type of thing. But again, like if you don't know how to take a blood pressure, there's really not a ton of sense into bringing a blood pressure cuff because you won't be able to get a blood pressure. Um, if you don't know how to intubate someone or you don't have those skills, there's really no um, advantage to bringing an airway kit because you won't know what to do with it. It'll probably just distract you from doing something uh, more useful at the time. Um, there's different telemedicine services on here. And then this is the Adventure Med 3000, Adventure Medical Kit, $794 kit. And you can see, and you can kind of add this up and what, what makes a kit that's $700 different than one that's $200. And, um, this has got um, doubles and triples of everything in the wound management department. Um, it also has some specialty items like a dental kit um, involved. It's got some airway um, equipment that, again, you, you do need special training to use this type of stuff. It's not always appropriate to put in an oral airway on somebody. And if certainly if you were gonna be putting in an oral airway, you'd wanna know some other airway techniques about how to roll people into recovery positions and so forth. So, you know, with the more expensive kits, now you've got more um, high acuity procedures that really need specialty training. And so that's the caveat that I always bring up to people is just to, you know, you can't buy safety. You have to plan for it. And part of the planning is training. So um, with that, um, I'm going to go back over here. And um, types of kits, uh, we talked about personal kit, but just having a quick kit or something for the dinghy, uh, something to treat life threats. I also keep this same kit out in, in the aft lazarette in the cockpit. It's got the tourniquet in it. Um, it's got some other bandaging um, and it's got some musculoskeletal um, splints that we'll, we'll talk about here in a second just real basic materials plus some preventative stuff like sunscreens, um, extra pair of sunglasses, and, um, and then you've got the cruising kit, which has got, you know, houses all of your equipment. So how much do you pay? And this is obviously just a couple of screenshots. You can see everything from in the bottom right corner, the Ocean Medics Voyager prescription kit, weighing in at $2,360. Um, to what I mentioned earlier, the offshore kit, that's $9. I would say um, that if you're going to go on a race to Hawaii and you've got a big uh, substantial crew of several people, um, you know, you, you're going to spend several hundred bucks on, on a kit that's going to be appropriate for you. Um, but then again, it all comes back to who's on the boat, what are the risk factors, what are the skill levels, and um, do you know how to use everything in that kit? Because if you don't, then 
there's not a ton of sense in bringing it. Um, and then, of course, do you have telemedicine? And is there anything that is going to be of advantage to um, that particular group or consultation? So um, a, a kit that I recently found was um, the MyMedic. If you can see in the bottom left corner of this slide, there's the $200 Adventure Med Kit. And on this kit, there, uh, this is also a $200 kit. The reason I singled this one out is it has um, a lot of the equipment we use in our training courses are in this kit. It just was uncanny that they had um, put a lot of the same materials that we sort of preached towards. And, you know, there's, good, there's a lot of good kits. Waterproof case, um, pretty compact. I don't think it's appropriate for a large crew over a large amount of time, but this might be a, a, you know, good enough for coastal crews. Um, we talked about telemedicine already. And so now I'm just going to give you the story of two first aid kits. Um, this is my boat here. And this was on a trip from Santa Cruz down to Panama um, and then through the canal over to ultimately back up to Florida. And in that year, um, in about eight months, we had kind of the spread that you saw earlier with um, the minor cuts, abrasions, contusions being of the most common injuries. And then there were some of these more serious lacerations that, well, the two toes are both mine. Um, I've learned my lesson and I wear shoes on deck now. Gag while anchoring far right picture. My wife's well, it's got the splinter through the nail. We ended up having to um, try to cut it out and it didn't seem to work. Uh, we ended up scraping it down and removing it from the top uh, with an IV catheter. But um, among those injuries, so these were our injuries. We had crew, family, all sorts of stuff. We had MCL tear, UTI, cold sore, norovirus, epididymitis. Uh, I'm certain there was a hemorrhoid on board, back spasm, back rash, stomach virus, shoulder pain, ear infection, all these different things. And, you know, looking back at that, is there a kit that can prepare you for that? And the answer is not really. Um, we had the luxury of telemedicine in a different sort of fashion where uh, my brother-in-law is an ER doc and one of my best friends, so I just bug him um, with pictures and, and questions. But um, there's no way you can prepare for everything that's possible. Otherwise, you're going to have to go to medical school and spend a ton of money. But what you can do is look at each person um, objectively and plan for what you think are going to be the most common problems and then look at the literature that we've already had put in here and have a well-stocked first aid kit. Um, same thing on a little kayak. Um, it was, I had about the room of a Nalgene bottle to fit a first aid kit. And so I planned for the real serious things like um, blood loss, a lot of, a couple of survival equipment pieces. Um, but I noticed on the, um, on look in looking at long distance kayaking, that skin breakdown was a huge component. And then finding out that Hibbins and over the counter body cleanser works really, really well for things like boat butt and um, boils and abscesses. And so, you know, suddenly you're kind of clearing room out for things that are more common to the sport that you're looking at. And in this case, I had all sorts of skin issues. The trip was great. Um, if you look in the upper right hand corner, it, I got the crap beat out of me, but I got there and I was pretty happy when I did. <laughs> um, and then ultimately, you know, having a good reference. Um, this Michael Jacobs book is fantastic. It's small. Um, I've also talked to Michael recently and he's a, um, a real neat guy. He's done a lot for the, for the uh, maritime medicine industry. Um, a book like this in most of the maritime medicine books, they're going to have procedures in there that are very invasive. And I want, 
I want people to realize that not everything that you read inside the book is something that you should just quickly and electively start trying. Because when it talks about safety pinning someone's tongue to their shirt to keep their airway clear, you have to understand why you're doing that and not just going and doing that. And I've never seen that done personally. There's a lot of airway techniques to keep an airway open that you can also use. So that with the caveat, um, or that is the caveat, but having a good resource is a great thing. Um, I'll show you a couple of other resources that um, I'll be sending your direction. One is, this is an example medical form. This is not um, to say that this is the, the ultimate medical form, but this would be something to have on each person um, and say, hey, you know, fill this out for me, take your time and um, let's go through it together or um, I'll talk to your doctor or something like that. Another great thing to have within a kit is to have some sort of uh, reference material like um, a soap note, which is just a way to record um, patient information. And this will help uh, prime you to ask the right questions. In conjunction with um, some decent training, this can be a really, really valuable asset to you. Um, and it'll go through with some charts and um, and these are all the different types of questions that we would ask in a patient assessment. Um, and so this is just a medical record that can go in your first aid kit. I'll send you guys this PDF. You can print it off a thousand times. And um, so, you know, having these different references is important. Um, adding to that skill and training uh, and telemedicine, and you start to really build up a, a nice looking plan, which is very different than just hopping in a boat and buying a thousand dollar kit and hoping for the best with CPR and first aid training. Um, so with that uh, first aid kit, one of the conclusions here, prevention is the key. So right clothing, right shoes, right nutrition, right sleep patterns, diet, health, equipment, planning, preparedness, checklists, and training between <laughs> That laundry list, um, some sort of interweave with other components of preparation for the boat. Um, but if, uh, you know, if you follow a list and you, and you try your best to make a, a really nice safety plan, you're gonna do better than if you didn't. Um, each boat has different factors influencing their first aid kit, their first aid kit plans. And so knowing life threats and stabilizing patients. That is CPR. That's also keeping airways open, rescue breathing, stopping major hemorrhage, um, including direct pressure and tourniquets, um, treating for shock and other environmental problems. All of those should be things that um, you do learn in a CPR and first aid class, but again, you're going you're gonna to know more the more time you have to actually practice it in a longer class. Um, know the limits, know your contents, and then build redundancies and ha have uh, um, plans on top of plans. Uh, so with that, Michael, my slide deck is done. I'm okay. going to, I have just some information um, about our nonprofit, Backcountry Medical Guides, which is based out of Santa Cruz and part-time up here in Bellingham. But we have been doing the, um, a series of medical programs at Ensignal Yacht Club uh, for Pack Cup members. And it's been really fun. It's been uh, many years in the works and everyone seems to be having a great time with it. So uh, look us up on backcountrymedicalguides.org. The phone numbers, the emails, um, feel free to just call me and ask me questions too. Uh, I definitely... Uh, um, field a lot of questions for, um, let me see here. Let me stop. Am I, how, how do you, how am I looking right now? Am I still you, on a, you look like you're speaking from the depths of hell, um, <laughs> which is nice. Uh, but, uh, you're still sharing the screen. 
Okay. Uh, oh, Jesus. Me... Stop on the screen. You should have a stop sharing button. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, pause share. How's that? Yeah, while you're working on that, uh, Jim Quancy uh, says uh, to remind folks, I'm going to just fix that, to remind folks that, um, you know, when we, when we use the GWU service, uh, we offer the option to sign up for the system, uh, the coverage on the return trip. And it, it's arguably, that's even more important. The trip can be longer. And although you may not be pushing harder, you may also be having crew that isn't quite uh, at, their, at their sharpest. So um, it's an unbelievably reasonable cost. And it's such cheap insurance to, to uh, be providing for the, the health and safety of your crew. Um, so I guess we're open to questions, unless either of you has more to add to what's been presented. Um, okay. No, not not for me. Okay. Um, you know, one one point I was going to make uh, when you were showing the medical kits, I've had both soft sided and and hard case medical kits, and boy, particularly the first few days of the pack cut, but even the whole thing, things get tossed around, and that hard case just just keeps the product in such better condition. Um, yeah. I, I have a couple of those. Uh, it's gonna get dark before it gets light again here. But I, I've got a couple of these Mimetic kits here mm -hmm. um, that I can just kind of show you what they look like when you bust one open. And um, this is the kit and I'm not endorsing any specific brand. I just think it's a nice kit. Um, and you open it up and you've got everything pretty well organized between uh, bleeding, um, outdoor sunscreen, lip balm, stings, bites, uh, cuts and scrapes and all the contents. You know, so it's just a really yeah. nice, well laid out kit. Of course, if something serious was to happen and you were digging through here the first time, that would be um, well behind the curve. Yeah. And so you want to make sure that you know how to treat life threats, how to access this equipment really quickly. If something um, did happen. And uh, anyway. Yeah, it shouldn't be the first time you go through it. Yeah. So, you know, actually going to make the same point that whatever kit you decide to buy, you should really unpack it and go through it before, you know, before you leave shore, because when you're dealing with an emergency, you want to know what's in there and you want to know exactly where to find it. So I got, I got three comments, two from the chat log and one from my own. Uh, question from Bill Hardesty, best band-aids for on the fly? Oh gosh, that's tough. Um, I like, I like having, I get cuts a lot on my hands and a lot of my knuckles. I like having the knuckle bandages. Um, but you can even make your own band-aids out of duct tape. And That's what Quancy said. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I got these, uh, I, had a, I had some skin work done here and I was using these waterproof band-aid band-aids on them, right? Uh, and I had to keep it covered for about a week. I change it every day it peeled off enough skin that now I'm healing that. So. Well, they, they do have skin tape. Um, yeah. Well, that so would have been good. with every piece of equipment there, you know, just like sailors know with stainless, you have to have the right type of stainless. You have to have everything. There's so many little details involved and the, the same goes for every single per piece of first aid equipment. Um, they make skin tape that is gentle on your skin if you're going to have right. tape on your skin for prolonged amounts of time. Yeah, it's also that porous and allows it to breathe. Um, the same with like uh, tweezers. You'll get tweezers, which I think is an essential part of a first aid kit. But if you buy the 50 cent ones on Amazon, they're made of plastic. They don't work. If you buy the $2 ones on Amazon, they're metal. Then you can worry about what type of tip you're looking at. If it's a hatch or is if it's a point you don't want the pointy ones because they'll poke holes in all your other equipment um, same with uh, space blankets some of them are the size of a square some of them um, are nice big blankets and some of them you can actually get inside of they're like little bivy sacks that are very uh, comprehensive and and can be warmer so i like to order a couple of extra to uh, insulate the ice box um, 
Hang 20 wants to know about, and Hang 20 is a double-handed boat, but any special comments for double-handed boats? Oh, um, special comments for double-handed boats. Um, one would be that, well, th this is just talking about first aid kits. When an emergency happens, um, one of the procedures is to make sure the scene is safe. Um, in all of emergency medicine, make sure the scene is safe. When you apply that to a boat, it's to get control of your boat. So I'd say uh, the one thing you want to make sure is that everyone has a really good idea of how to control the boat, um, whether it's heaving to or reefing on their own by themselves versus having one crew that's stronger than the other, because that's going to be the first step to any of the emergencies is just gaining control. And um, that can be an, an issue in itself. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mentioning heaving too is a good point. It's almost a forgotten skill. Uh, but if your boat is capable of doing it, it's a, it's a tremendous way to just stop all that crazy shit and, and, and do what you have to do. A lot of the, the thin keeled boats don't heave do particularly well. Right. Uh, but, um, I've never tried it on my Santa Cruz, but I used to do it on my passport all the time. It's a great way to just mm -hmm. stop things. Um, so let's see. Uh, so here's a, here's a, here's a, I think this will be controversial, at least based on the advice I've been giving um, or getting and giving. Uh, defilibrators have come way down in price. Uh, you can get one at Costco for $400. Now, yeah. when I raised this with a, with a, with a MD pal of mine, we basically ended up concluding that it's just a way to annoy somebody while they die since you're too far from medical care. But what do you think? <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I'm going to defer this one to Adam, but I, I do have a question about it. Yeah, it's a tough question. I mean, look, if you want to buy a defibrillator because it makes you feel good, you know, there are rare cases of one shock and wake up. But the truth is that's a pretty rare situation. You know, usually um, the automatic defibrillators are, uh, uh, you know, functional for early defibrillation for a bridge to advanced care. Um, you know, the likelihood that if somebody has a cardiac arrest and uh, you, you know, defibrillate them once or twice with a defibrillator and then have them wake up and have a good outcome, you know, without early advanced care is, is pretty unlikely. Um, is it going to hurt to have it? No, if you want to, if you can really get one for 400 bucks. But, you know, I think that 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 same 400 bucks is probably better spent on other equipment that you're more likely to need that is going to um, probably make more of a difference in a more varied variety of situations that are probably more likely as well. Yeah, that that's the much more professional way of saying what I said. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so Jim, so this is, we got a ringer in the audience here. So Jim uh, Quancy is there sitting next to Mary Lovely uh, RN PhD, um, who, who does, and I'm going to actually ask him to do this a little later, a wonderful presentation on personal welfare. Uh, right, so they're both, oh yeah. So they're both quite aware of, of some of the things, but he's commenting on a couple of things on butt rash, change your underwear daily, hydrocodone If you even think your butt is itchy and then he, well, and, and you know, um, I think those of us who have done the race know that changing your underwear daily is a wild joke for the first three, four days. Um, you're lucky if you get your shoes off. But uh, he also mentions uh, hydration, which I think is, is a super important thing because so many other bad right. things happen. And that can be a function of, um, you can find a lot of hydration salt packets in first aid equipment too, but it should be more regular than that. You know, It should be something that you're more focused on. You're not digging into the first aid kit to make sure you're well hydrated. Um, that's a good preventative piece. And, yeah. and I would actually add sunscreen to that too. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes people think it doesn't matter or they apply it and forget to reapply it. And then, and then you've got a nasty sunburn and, you know, you lose a lot of water when, when you get sunburned too. It's not just, I, I didn't know that really. Can, yeah. I mean, any burn, any, you know, damage yeah. to the skin. So I'm, I'm a member of the U S sailing safety at sea committee. And I, I offered the proposal, uh, or the, the assertion that the number one killer of sailors isn't falling overboard and it isn't getting hit by the boom. 
it's sun exposure because of the increased risk of, of melanoma. Yep, yep exactly. Um, I was basically, you know, laughed off the thread, but I'm, I'm going to reassert it here because, yes, yeah, sunscreen, uh, particularly, particularly in the waters that we sail in in the Pacific Cup, is, is so important um, to just avoid that repeated assault on your skin. If you're going to only do the race once, fine, whatever. But if you're like me, if you're like Jim, if you're like half the people on this call who are going to be doing that passage or similar passages repeatedly, or if you ever leave your house when it's legal again, uh, you know, you, you, you got to protect yourself, you know, slip, slap, slop, like the Australians say. Yeah, wear a hat, make sure you get behind the ears. I mean, you know, got a bald spot and you're not wearing a hat. I mean, these are areas you want to make sure to get. Yeah, yeah, I guess I guess there's some key spots that have been found uh, for sun damage. One is one is like just below where the hat comes and then right the cuff of your sleeve, again, where people just don't think about. But depending on your habits, uh, it can be repeatedly assaulted. But I think we're crossing over from first aid and medical care to personal welfare and prevention. They're very closely related. Uh, oh, looks like we got a bunch more questions. You guys want to say something while I look them up here? Yeah, I was just going to make a comment about um, personal prevention because you know the best way to treat it. I mean, it's this is dumb, and we hear it, it's not dumb, but it sounds trite because we hear it so often. But the best way to treat an injury is to not have an injury. <laughs> and 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 it, and actually, a lot of the things, a lot of the calls that we get for the maritime service are for things that actually are very simple and preventable. So, for example. You know, we see a fair number of eye injuries amongst, uh, you know, engineers on ships and, you know, they're not, they're not wearing, uh, you know, eye protection or appropriate eye protection. Um, so, you know, whenever I'm, you know, either sailing or else in a situation where, you know, if I'm woodworking or doing something along those lines, oftentimes you'll be doing something and you'll get right up to the point where it's safe and then you kind of cross a line where suddenly some extra protection is needed. So, you know, you're leaning out to grab something and you're fine and your center of gravity is in a good spot, but then you cross that line where it's no longer in a good spot, but you haven't tied in. So just, you know, taking the time to stop and think about, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, am I tied in? Am I wearing a PFD? Do I have, you know, gloves on? Do I have eye protection on? And, you know, you don't need to, coach yourself in bubble wrap, but it really is important to have the mentality that when, to recognize when, when you're going to cross that line that you need a particular piece of safety equipment or a spotter or something along those lines. Um, and that's, you know, that's good practice when you're sailing and it's, it's, you know, good practice in general for injury prevention. Uh, so that's just my little plug. It's an excellent plug. Um, so we got a couple of questions there. Jim Quancy comments, long sleeve shirts. I think we're still talking about the sun. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, you, um, uh, you, you're, you're giving a, an excellent point. Uh, somebody once said that the key to a successful ocean racing is to always give 90%. Um, hold back 10% in reserve for when something comes up, for getting rest, for... Uh, pausing for a second to make sure you're doing things safely. And I, and I think that's uh, fairly good advice. Um, we have a question from an attendee and then we have a, another question from the, from the chat there. Would you include an IV set with solutions in case of, for example, hypovolemic shock or an open fracture? John, you want to take this and do you want me to start or do you want to start? <laughs> I'll let you go for it. Yeah. So I'm going to say this. If you've never started an IV before, you're not going to start one on, uh, <laughs> you know, on a rolling boat. Uh, you know, unless, unless your person has the most amazing veins that you've ever seen. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, so it, it probably doesn't have that much utility. The other thing is, you know, you can only carry a very limited amount of IV fluid. Um, so, you know, if you have a bag of 500 cc's or a thousand cc's, it's probably not going to make a huge, huge difference. Um, again, it's an example of something where if you have the skill and you have the money, it's not going to hurt you to have it, but chances are you're not going to need it and your money is probably better spent on other things. 
And I also uh, want to make the point that there are a lot of interventions that are uh, much simpler that people don't often think about, such as raising the legs. Um, so, you know, raising the legs in someone who's passed out, you know, when they're lying down, just having them raise their legs up and having that fluid flow is roughly the same as giving them a 250 cc to 500 cc bolus through an IV. But, you know, when someone goes down, most people are thinking, where's the IV? Where's the fluids? So stopping and thinking about what your interventions are um, can buy you a lot uh, before you even have to think about, you know, starting an IV. Um, John, other thoughts? Uh, that's kind of my, that's kind of my thought too. Um, you know, oftentimes IV, IV starts are for IV drugs as a, as a port or a route to administer drugs. And again, if you're not comfortable or familiar with giving IV drug medications, then there's probably not a huge use to bringing that kind of equipment. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, so there was a, a, a question from, uh, let's see, who was it here? Mark Jordan asking, you know, we spent quite a bit of time talking about wearing sunscreen, uh, which chemicals are, are good and which are bad. And of course, I think, um, I'm assuming effectiveness, but uh, one of the big issues we've been focusing on is reef safety. Yeah. And uh, Rowena posted a very nice uh, article. It's up on our knowledge base. Um, which I summarized as don't use the ingredients uh, oxybenzone or uh, oxytinoxate. Um, they're bad for the reef. They will kill the little guys, the corals. Um, and don't use the sunscreen with nanoparticles, which has, I think, little sun protection, but it makes your skin look pretty. Um, do use titanium or zinc dioxide. Uh, these are highly effective. They don't have to be all icky white. And uh, as far as we know, they, they, don't, uh, they don't hurt the reef. Um, uh, see if Rowena is still on the line. See if she wants to add anything to that. Let me find her here. All right, Rowena, if you wanna if you wanna talk and unmute, you can uh, add anything to that you want. Looks like she's still muted. Oh, well, maybe I did that. Uh, give it one second. Then we got a couple more questions in there. Yeah, I see one on the uh, zip kits. There's a new laceration product that looks like. Uh, bandages you put in parallel to um, to the laceration with zip ties that go across the laceration. Um, I've only seen those in practice, and I ha I haven't seen them in real life. Have you used them at all in hospital? No, I haven't. I mean, we use sutures, and and the question about how they hold up in marine environments. Actually, that's a very good question, and it's one that I don't know the answer to. And you know, I do. Ah, go for uh, it. But, oh, secondhand, the, the fleet surgeon for the Cruising Club of America, which is a large group of sailors, um, is just absolutely enthusiastic about these. He's used them. He thinks they're great. Um, they make up for a whole host of uh, lack of skill on suturing that um, I have demonstrated on all kinds of materials, excluding human skin. So... Uh, um, uh, you know, it, it sounds like a great product. Yeah, I, I actually is it think still prescription only. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Actually, okay. I mean, I've seen them in use, but we don't routinely use them. And I, I do think that they're great products. They have the potential to save a lot of time and certainly require less skill than suturing. Um, so I guess I don't have enough familiarity with them uh, personally to comment. But um, I will say that we you know, routinely do talk people through suturing uh, over the phone or okay. over video. And um, Betty asks, and I think you talked about this a little, I'm gonna add my own twist on this. What about a catheter? Um, I, will, I will give this piece of advice to everybody. Uh, if you're researching catheters, do it on somebody else's computer, perhaps one at the library, because otherwise the ads that come up on your computer for the next month are just not what you want. Um, but we, we carry catheters, even though none of us has used them, because uh, I know it can become very, uh, a very ser serious problem. I know that um, at least one person was evacuated from the boat Cocopelli on the return trip. The guy didn't pee for three days, and I guess at four days you die or something. Yeah, I think a catheter actually is a good thing to have. It, it is a, uh, you know, it's a, it's a low-cost item. 
Um, if somebody has urinary retention, it is a high risk. Uh, it's rare, but if it happens, it's a high risk issue. And uh, it, can, it can be very easy to relieve with the catheter. And you know, even though nobody wants to think about putting one in, it's actually a pretty easy procedure to do. And you know, somebody without any you know, extensive medical training can place one. I'm, I'm thinking halfway party. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, and this is why I can't get crew. Um, what's, oh, that was the anesthetic. Um, let's see if we get any more questions come up. Uh, meanwhile, maybe you guys want to compose some final thoughts. I, I think this has been uh, very educational, very thought provoking. Um, it, it strikes me that the, that the key message is there's a lot that a lot of us that are intending to head off sea don't know, offshore don't know, and that perhaps we've been taking for granted. Um, you know, I know on my last trip, I got a serious burn on my hand, which fortunately, um, my medical officer knew how to treat and I don't have any scars or anything, but, uh, uh, she, on the other hand, fell overboard. So we're even, uh, but we brought her back. So she was able to work on my hand. Um, but you know, things happen and, uh, boy, you need to have the stuff to deal with it. You know, getting some little cheap ass you know, tiny med kit and, uh, you know, comic book size pamphlet is not going to cut it. It shouldn't pass inspection. Uh, and you should not be even thinking about that. You really, you really need to deal with some things that come up. Right. Um, that being said, I mean, I, I of course have a major bias toward <laughs> education being probably one of the wisest investments because given some very mediocre and rudimentary pieces of equipment, I, I feel like I could do quite a few things, at least for a short term. Um, and it, it really helps when you've gone through all the equipment with your own hands, ripped open all the gauze pads, applied them, tried a few different times, because the first time you do a pressure bandage, it's not going to be perfect. And the first time you bust any of these equipment, pieces of equipment out, it just really helps to have done it all once before. Um, and so that's my piece, but of course I have strong bias towards education. Yeah, and, and, and my final thought is, I guess I'll just reiterate what I said before. Um, you know, our, our service is here for you and I'll just reiterate the call early, call often philosophy, because you can, so, you know, you want to solve a small problem before it becomes a big problem. Um, I agree with John, John's point about education, but you know, you can't obviously, you know, if you're not a doctor, you can't learn it all. Um, so we're here to sort of augment that knowledge and skill to help you out if you need, if you need it. So a couple of final points. Um, uh, one as a, as a, a question I had intended to put to you earlier. Uh, uh, but before that, there's one that came up on the, on the chat, which is any book recommendations. The last read was wilderness medicine, uh, by William full, uh, Forgy. And a lot seems to translate, um, any, anything more maritime focused. Um, I had that, that book. Um, I just put it into the chat. The oh, Michael, Michael Jacobs, Jacobs Marine, Marine Medicine. Medicine. Yeah. There's uh, another one called uh, First Aid Afloat. That's pretty good. I have that. And yeah. And by, and by the way, having at least one book is a requirement of, of the safety rules. Um, I, I've got an anecdote about, I had, I had two doctors. I was inspecting the boat. Um, and, and uh, 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 you know, I go through their stuff and I say, well, where's your, where's your medical handbook? And they said, well, we're doctors. And I said, well, a um, couple of things there. Uh, what, what kind of doctors are you? I'm a, I'm a psychiatrist, you know, I'm a gynecologist. I'm like, okay, get the book. Um, but the other issue is, you know, if, if the medical professional on board is the one that's injured, Right. You want some sort of instruction. Um, the, the, the other question that I wanted to put, to, oh, and somebody suggests, and this is an excellent one for all of your documentation, carry a PDF version, uh, because if it gets wet, it'll be sad. Um, but don't have that be your only version because electronics suck. Um, the, uh, 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 one of the things, you know, as you invest a lot of money in, in these drugs, um, some of them will expire. And you guys may be shy about 
agreeing with this and you can just be, sit there stone faced. Some drug expiration dates matter a lot and some don't matter much at all. Um, but it is very important if you're going to ignore expiration dates to get competent advice on which ones you can slide on and which ones you need to pay really good attention to. And, you know, your, your internist, and I got mine to go, to go along with the game, but your internist may need some talking into to give you that advice because they'll, they'll be nervous about it. But some drugs are hard to replace. Look at that stone faced. I told you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you did it. You said everything. <laughs> I, I revealed the, the ugly secret. Okay. So I think this has been great guys. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you for staying on for the whole uh, uh, show. Um, that was great. We, we hope never to have to call GWU during the race, but um it's wonderful that you guys are out there. The things you've done have been just spectacular. And John, the, um, uh, you know, the courses you have are good. And, and, and thank you very much for, for your presentation as well. We will post this video to the website, uh, hopefully tomorrow, as well as, uh, John, if you send me the materials, I'll get them uh, put up as well. Final, final thoughts? That's about it. Okay. Yeah, stay healthy and, and safe, everybody. All right. In these strange times, but uh, <laughs> yes, they are. Okay. All, All right. right. Take care. Well, I'm gonna right. I'm gonna end this and stop the recording. I'll stop the recording first. Somehow, there we go.